We're going we're to have an exciting afternoon, and I'm pumped for this uh, conversation that we're going to have today. We have uh, an unbelievable uh, honor and privilege to have Dr. Mark uh, Horstermeyer here with us today. Um, he is the dean of the School of Engineering, um, and uh, he's going to come and share with us here in a minute. Now, I know on student ministry nights, you guys are so impressed with how smart and articulate Pastor Cody and Pastor Jeremy and you know, myself, how, how we are, but, um, but uh, Dr. Mark Horstmeyer uh, is, uh, is, is on another level, and uh, so grateful for you, man, and your ministry, and, uh, God, and just what you're, you, you, you bring, and uh, what we are going to learn uh, through that this, e- this afternoon. So um, without further ado, give it up for Dr. Mark Horstmeyer. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Um, I've been thinking about this topic for a long time. I grew up in a home that atheistic evolution was the common thing to believe. There was a time in my life, particularly age 13 to 18, where I, if it didn't, if I didn't touch it, taste it, feel it, look at it, I didn't believe in it. I didn't believe in anything invisible. And that's called a materialistic evolution position. I didn't believe in God. There was no God. And over long periods of time, random chance events uh, from molecules, from atoms and everything, became all the way through to man. So monkeys to man and all that sort of thing. And um, I was taught that. And I remember in uh, ninth grade, I was my basketball coach at the time, Mr. Smith, I said, uh, and he was, they were going through this evolution thing. And I said, well, what about Adam and Eve in the church? And how does Adam and Eve work out with this monkey thing? And my coach, who's my basketball coach, said, just believe the Bible. Well, I didn't know he was a Christian at all. But he said, just believe the Bible. Don't believe this monkey's to man stuff. And that stuck in my head. And that, that, I wasn't a Christian at the time, but I, I was just trying to work it out. Okay? So tonight, I just want to share with you a fundamental thought. Because what's going to happen sometimes, someplace in your life, you're going to run into somebody, and they're going to say, we came from monkeys. You're going to run into them, and they're going to say, we, we all came from monkeys. All right? I'm going to show you tonight that we didn't, <laughs> and I'm going to show you the evidences that they argue that where we came from, and I'm going to show you there's not much evidence. Okay? But underneath this is an idea. It's an idea of how, what glasses we put on to look at information. The information that I was looking at, okay, we we find a fossil. For example, this fossil right here. When does this fossil exist? Anybody, when does this exist? A long time ago, okay? What do you say? He said a thousand years ago. When does this exist? Anybody else? It exists now. It's right, it exists right here, man. Now, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to pass this around, and I want you to look underneath here, because on on, underneath this will come out, it'll say this was 250 million years ago. Any fossil you take out of the dirt, you'll see it'll say 250 million or 150 million and, and 100 million, 50. That's how they know that this thing is millions of years old. You want to know what? There's no date on this thing. It's not going to come out of the ground and say this is 250 million years old. I'm going to pass it around and you all can look at it. By the way, it's pretty heavy, so you might want want two hands to look to do this. All right, so by the way, these are Ammonites, and I was in the highest mountains, the Rift Mountains, the Atlas Mountains in North Africa, the African Rift in Morocco, and me and two of my Muslim buddies, uh, we we cut out these, these fossils. These are deep sea animal fossils, deep sea. They were found on the highest mountain peaks in North Africa. How did the deepest sea animals get on the highest mountains? How could that have happened? You go to Liberty University Online Academy. flood, and all this sedimentation happened, 
And so, and then mountains built after, after at the end of the flood, and that's what caused these things that were in deep sea to move to the top of mountains. Nat Natasha, is that your name? Can you come and get this and pass it around? It's heavy again, so. All right, now, so we find a fossil, and we go through the scientific method. Who knows what the scientific method is? Anybody know? Let's see, a student. What student? Do you know? What's the first thing you do in a scientific method? Step one. No, you make an observation, right? You got to see something. All right? And so I see a fossil, make an observation. What's, what's the next thing I do? Then you make a theory, a working hypothesis, and one step is over millions and millions of years, random chance events, molecules to man happen in a, in a layer of rock, uh, these fossils came about. That's one. There's another working hypothesis. Another one would say that these animals uh, lived at the bottom of the ocean, some catastrophic event happened, and they became immediately buried in something. Okay? Two working hypotheses. What's the third step you do in a scientific method? Somebody. Anybody know? Yes? Nope. Not ask a question. You do experiments. You do experiments to falsify your working hypothesis, your guess. So you have to do experiments. Okay, so if I said that thing, it, it took a millions and millions of years for that to develop, set up the experiment to last a millions and millions of years. Go ahead. Has anybody ever done that? No. Nothing in the evolutionary time frame, millions and millions of years, has ever done an experiment to prove or show that. Never. And to do those experiments, after they've been falsified, not falsified, it becomes a theory. And then many more experiments becomes a law. Those are the four steps. Observation, hypothesis, experiments for theory, then experiments for law. So what am I telling you? I'm telling you that evolution has never been experimentally validated. It can never be a theory, never a law. What is it then? It's a working hypothesis. It's somebody's guess. That's the best it could ever be. It's somebody's guess. Now, if you believe you came from monkeys, you can believe whatever you want. The thought police aren't out yet. But it's not science at that point. It's not a law and it's not a theory. I had this colleague come from England when I was at Mississippi State University and a professor there. And he said, I heard you're a young earth creationist and you believe the Bible. I said, yep. He goes, well, you're the highest published person at Mississippi State. How could you believe that? I said, I'd start with the scientific method. And he said, well, I'm shocked to hear that because I'm going to start with the scientific method. So I just went through the same steps with him, and I said, show me an experiment that you and your, your gang have come up with to show that evolution ever happened. And, of course, he couldn't, and he didn't. And so I got him to see, look, then you believe that. It's your belief. It's your religion. Okay? Believe what you want to believe. That's all it is. All right, you with me? That's the framework and that's the framework we're going to talk about when we go through this about monkeys to man thing. It's got to be the scientific method and the steps. What are they again? Step one, everybody. Observation, step two. Hypothesis, good. Step three, experiments for, th for theory. And then what's the last one? Experiments law. Okay, you got it, you got it. All right, here we go. Okay, so here's the four steps. Now, let's go through the example here. Next slide. So we found a fossil, and we say something existed between monkeys and man. By the way, you want to become famous, go to the Old Divide Gorge, go to anywhere in Africa, find some fossil, and say it's a missing link between monkeys and man, you'll be on the front cover of the paper. Won't be true, but uh, you'll be on the front cover of the paper. Next, next slide. So the fossil became lithified long periods of time, and he had these transitional forms between monkeys and man. Next slide. All right. So set up the experiments. I'm telling you, you can't. By the way, the scientific method is based on human experience. If somebody says, get this, if somebody says that these animals and all these things lived long before humans, it's not science immediately. Why? Because science is limited to human experience. We're testing it. So they're making up some story. They're just making up some story. They might as well have, you know, the, uh, the prince or the you know, kiss the, fr the princess kiss the frog and become a prince, right? I mean, might as well. Next, next slide. So step three, again, the scientific law. 
So evolution can never be a theory, and it can never be science. Next slide. So I want to go through this thing of faith versus science. We're going to talk about these issues as during the final result and pr presuming the wrong history. Everything's a function of its history. You're a function of your history. You're here today because the history brought you here today. And it's your history that will project you for tomorrow, okay? And every rock is like that. Every animal is like that. Then I want to talk a little bit about the tenets of evolution, and I'm going to summarize. Next slide. So this guy, Colin Patterson, he had all these evolutionists in the room, okay? And he asked this question. It was the Chicago Field Museum, and uh, it, he was from the Chicago Field Museum when he gave this. He said, the question is, can you tell me anything you know about evolution? Anything. That is true. I tried that question on the geology staff, the field of museum of natural history, and the only answer I got was silence. I tried it on the members of the evolutionary morphology seminar at the University of Chicago, a very prestigious body of evolutionists, and all I got there was silence for a long time, and eventually one person said, I do know one thing, it ought not to be taught in high school. I tell the evolutionists, when I'm on a plane and I'm meeting people, I was just on a plane last week and met an evolutionist, I said, give me one evidence, just one, where evolution happened, going from molecules to man, and they couldn't. Next slide. All right, so here's the framework, these words. I want you to see this statement of faith. Creationism, a belief that God, who made everything so that scientific method is not applicable, versus evolution says things are explained in the natural realm according to scientific restrictions. This is what you'll read on Wikipedia. Next slide. This is wrong. This is not what we say. Next. So, Johannes Kepler, the astronomer, tried to explain from Deuteronomy 29, 29, which says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things he has revealed, he has given unto us and our children forever. He tried to say God is autonomous. In other words, God's everything and information. So, outside of this circle on the left, th those are the secret things we'll never know. And inside of the circles, all, all the information that we will know, but that little small segment, that little science, that's what we know today. That's what we know now. On the right hand, what science, scientists try to do, some atheistic evolutionists try to do, is try to say, no, science has, de determines everything. And they even made a statement in the Humanist Manifesto that said, on the sixth day, man created God. That was their perspective. Okay? Next slide. So the, here's what really it should be. The creationist faith is belief in an all-knowing, perfect, never-changing being who observed all past history events versus the evolutionist faith that says a belief in a limited knowledge, imperfect, always-changing being who is not present to observe past events. In other words, they're just believing what other people told them. That's it. Okay? They both have faith. If the issue is not a faith, the issue is what's the object of your faith? What do you have faith in? Okay? Next slide. It's all right. You can go ahead. You're doing good. You just keep going with me here. So, creationist thinking has allowed me to be a critical thinker in, in the scientific realm. Okay? Particularly about this thing in fracture and fatigue. So, what I do sometimes, I'll get calls from lawyers and I'll say, hey, this car crash happened. And how did, how did this car crash occur? So my background is, and, and I went to undergrad at West Virginia University and went to Ohio State Master's PC at Georgia Tech, and then I worked on designing thermonuclear bombs in California for 15 years, and then I was at Mississippi State 15 years looking at all fracture and fatigue, and so I've done with these things. I was on the Columbia Accident Investigation Board. I looked at the 9-11 World Trade Center towers when the planes crashed into those buildings. So fracture and fatigue, how something breaks, real important, okay? So show, show the next slide, this, this picture. This is a fatigue specimen. So what happens? We take the specimen, we pull it like this many times, fatigue, cyclic fatigue, and it'll break. And if you looked at this surface, this fracture surface here, can you see like the difference? Like there's a little dark area up the top and then kind of a little rugged area down below. Can you kind of see that difference in your mind's eye? And I can tell you, and I can say, okay, number one scientific method, you make an observation. You look at this fracture surface, okay? All right? Then, then what would you say? You've got to make a working hypothesis, yes? Step two. So where, so where did this break? Give me your working hypothesis, anybody. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Anybody, ready, set, go. Raise your hand. It's, there's nothing wrong. Yeah, tell me, what do you think? Where do you think the most of the life is in this specimen that you're looking at? 
with that. Where the black line is, right there, that's where most of the cycles, oh, okay, we're, we're broke. How about anybody else? Anybody else want to hazard a guess? Anybody, 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 somebody moved over there. Do you want to guess over there? No, 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 okay. Over here, we have a vote over here, number two. What's that? Where the what is? Where the dot is. Which dot? The one on the bottom. Wrong. It's a good guess. It's a good try. Actually, he's wrong too. Repeat the question. I forgot the question. I'm 60 years old. What do you think? I have to remember these things? No, the question is, like, which, where in this, where did most of the cycles, if this thing was a million cycles, where did most of the cycles, which part of this little specimen you're just looking at? You, you think it's the light gray? You want, you want to counter it? Go ahead. She thinks it's the dark gray. So there. You want to counter argue? What's your counter argument? Go ahead, argue back. What's that? Why do you agree with that? You don't have to buckle that soon. You don't have to give in like that. The light gray or the... Okay, we're going to vote. Now, all you under 18, this is your chance. In America, we vote. Okay? How many say the gray area? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight... 9, 10, anybody more than 10, anybody 10, 11, 11, anybody 12, 12, 12, right there, anybody 13, anybody 13, anybody 13, no 13, okay, 13 light gray. How many dark gray, raise your hand. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. How many didn't vote, raise your hand, you un-Americans? <laughs> they didn't vote in America. Come on now. Why didn't you vote? Because you didn't know what it was. That's right. 99.9% .9 of all the cycles, million cycles, 990,000 cycles were to a part of that specimen that you cannot see with your eye. It's, it's way up. It's way up in the deep region. There's a little white spot on the very top, a little white spot that you can't see. And 99 999,000 cycles are up there. This, this gray area, this is only the last half cycle. Only a half a cycle. And then that, that dark gray up there, uh, there's about, about maybe 1,000 cycles. But about a million on something you can't even see. What's the point? You didn't know the history. And you're making a guess about the history, and all you see is now. Just like that fossil, you just see now, and you're trying to guess what happened backwards. And when you're looking at that, you can make up some story. And your story, all it is is a story, not science. Unless you actually know the history. You see where I'm saying on this? You see where I'm going with this? All right, next slide. Keep going, next. Keep going, next. 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 Okay, now, let's talk about these monkeys to man thing. So, where did we come from? The Bible said, Genesis 1, Sunday 6, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That's what the Bible says. Next slide. Okay? The evolutionists say, you know, we evolved by nature. The Bible says, we didn't evolve, we were made. We were created and made. In fact, there's two parts in, in the Hebrew language when it says we were created. We created, Baha means something out of nothing, but we were also, the Hebrew word yatsard means we were made of something, and it was dirt, right? God took the dirt out of the ground, and then he yatsard, he built something, but when he spoke, right, he breathed into the dirt and it became a living soul. That was the create, so it was both it was both Yatzer built from something, but also create something out of nothing. There's only one entity that can create something out of nothing. That's God. That's the creator. We could take two plus two and make four, right? How many like Legos? Anybody like Legos? You can build something in Legos, right? We take a couple things, put it together, you make it. That's Yatzer. That's building, right? All right, next slide. What about cavemen? Anybody hear about cavemen? Lived in caves? Yep, yep. 
And they say, okay, humans lived in caves a long time before we built houses and everything. Do you know there's cavemen in the Bible? Did anybody know there's cavemen in the Bible? Who lived in a cave? What's that? Cain. Like Cain killed Abel, Cain? David lived in a cave. Who did? A, a lot of people lived? I know what you're saying, Lot. The guy Lot. Who else? That's right. Who else? Anybody else? Job is mentioned to live in a cave. Anybody else? What's that? That Adam and Eve, they may have lived in a cave? After, after, after the fall. Maybe, maybe. I don't know about them. I don't know if we have any evidence in them. All right, next slide. You've probably seen this picture. The emergence of man, or was he created some other way? Next slide. All right. So placing skulls of dead humans and extinct apes in some sort of progression, ape-like thing, you will see this at field museums. Anybody been to field museum before or natural history like in D.C. or Chicago or anything like that? And they'll tell you the story about monkeys to man and they're going to show you pictures like this. And they're going to show you skulls. Here's the first question I want you to ask them. Is that the real skull or was that some clay model of it? And you'll be surprised at how many of those, those people and they don't know. Now, if they're honest, they'll say, I don't know. Most of them, they're not real. They're, they're, they're clay models. Okay? Next slide. Now, how, do we, how, did, how did people distinguish between monkeys and man? I'm going to go through about six or seven of these points. The first one is the shape of the jawbone. Supposedly, man has a parabola and an ape has a U-shaped jaw. Next slide. The palate of the mouth. So inside of the mouth, the arch. Man's more arch, ape is, the ape is flat. Next. But it's interesting that the glottal baboon today has a parabolic mouth, an arch plate. So then how do you distinguish between a human and a glottal baboon if that's one of your characteristics? Okay, next slide. The teeth. Most of man's teeth, mankind's teeth, the same size, where apes have large canine teeth. And that's what, these are distinguishing features. Next slide. So, and there's supposedly 30 to 7 million years ago, branching from apes that occur with man. So they call them old apes, okay? And then there was a branch till you had modern apes and modern monkeys and then mankind. That's a supposed story. And again, wh what experiments were done to show that that ever happened? Zero. You make up your story, it's okay. It's a story. Next slide. So let's look at this Piltdown Man in 1912. The Piltdown Man was first claimed to be about 500,000 years old, and fluoride tests yielded about 2,000 years old, a little bit later. It was known to be a modern monkey jaw with teeth fouled down and stained to look old. See, what happened in 1859, Darwin's Origin of the Species was written, and the claim was, and Darwin himself said, the problem with evolution are missing links, going from monkeys to man. So that's the problem, they're missing so we have to find them, and we're going to find them in time. So he's starting to get momentum, and people like this are starting to say, well, I want to believe in evolution, whatever. And so they, they come up, and there's the picture of Piltdown Man. That's an actual picture that was drawn. And, and this, for many years, was shown as a monkeys to man transition until somebody found it's just a monkey. That's all it was. And what happened, there was little pieces found. Little fabrication of pieces, of bones, and then some artist put it together and made it look like monkey-like and human-like. So an artist did it. And then later they found out uh, it wasn't quite monkeys to man thing at all. It was a monkey. Next. After the Piltdown. That was an actual picture in a newspaper of the Piltdown man that later was only a monkey. But back in those days, right? They're saying, oh, here's the monkeys to man thing. And when fire was first determined, it was probably built down man. All right, next. Next. Keep going. This is a newspaper. New York Times, look at this, 1912. Darwin theory is proved true. You will see this over and even today. 
oh, this is man that's proved evolution, proved evolution. When they say prove, what are they trying to say? They're trying to say the scientific method did something to show that this happened. The newspapers are saying this, and it was a lie. Now, that's terrible because we know newspapers don't lie. All right, keep going. Next slide. So we really found out in 1953 that Piltdown was an orangutan. Wow. Yeah. So from 1912 to 1953, how many years is that? Oh, you mathematicians. Chloe, what's the number? 53 minus 12. What is it? 56, something like that. Yeah, 41. Let's try 41. Thank you. Yeah, good. Penn State. All right. Yep. So 41 years, this lie went on. And people were starting to believe, oh, I believe monkeys to man. Believe monkeys to man. Next slide. Let's talk about the next one. Yeah. Next slide. The next one, Neanderthal man. So the Neanderthals, uh, if you read in, in, in encyclopedias, they'll say, oh, yeah, these were transitional forms, all that kind of thing. This is a, a perspective on it. They were homo sapiens, just like us, completely 100% human. Now, if you look at, at, the, at the bodies of, of, these, of, of the Neanderthals, and we found many bones and all that kind of thing, they kind of look uh, very thick uh, boned, and um, they were hunched over, and a lot of them had rickets, that kind of thing. There's a guy named, uh, uh, he passed away, this guy named Dennis Quazzo. He was a, he was a, um, um, a dentist, an orthodontist, and he measured the different uh, 75 parts on, on the human head. And there's these longitudinal studies that were done when people were three years old, five years old, six years old, all the way in the 80s, and they, they showed how the human head changes over time. So, for example, that hat you're wearing, when you're 70 years old, that hat will not fit you. You're 80 years old. Because what's going to happen is you continually grow. I have a Steelers hat right now. I, I wore when I was 20, and I can't wear it today because my head got bigger. Okay? So, um, not that I have a big head, Chloe. I'm just saying that every head grows. All right? So, all these studies over all these countries, all these continents, men, women, everything, you, you continually change and you're continually thickening. And there's a funny thing you can do. If you go to the Science Museum in Chicago, you can take a picture of yourself, and you can put your age in everything, and you can dial your age forward to see how, how you look like when you're older and dial it back. And I did this thing where I said, okay, you know, I took my picture and everything, and I dialed it forward, and I said, hey, what do I look like when I'm 100? And I go, ooh, that looks pretty bad. And I said, well, I plan on living to 120, so let's do that one. So I was like 120, and this old chin got bigger, and this thing went down like this, lost my hair, and it was like, this is pretty ugly. I go, this isn't true. So then I dialed it back to when I was 20 and 10, and I was like, ooh, this thing was exactly right. So my future is looking pretty ugly here. I'm telling you that. Jeez. But then I did something else. I said, what if I'm 500 years old? What if I'm 700 years old? What if I'm 900 years old? Has anybody read in the Bible, anybody live 900 years old? These are the people that live before what? Before what? Before the Genesis flood. They lived all these years. And guess what they look like? Neanderthals. That's what they look like. So this could have been a 600-year-old Enoch. 700-year-old Lama. And that's what this, this Dennis Quazzo ended up showing. He also was an expert, a world expert on Neanderthals. And he went and he took all their measurements and he put them in line and he realized that the evolutionists were trying to make it monkeyish look. So he recorrected it and all that kind of thing and it just looked like you know, a linebacker for the San Francisco 49ers. And, and that's it, fully human. Next slide. The other one was P. King Man. And P. King Man in World War II, this guy, Davidson Black, said he found a skull, and there's pictures of it, and uh, found a tooth, found the skull, and ever since then it was lost. But P. King, and it was in China, so that's why the P. King Man. But so there's, the, and, and they made it look like this. Okay, again, it's an artist, right? You take this little thing, and you make a picture of a monkeys to man thing, and that's, that's what you think it, it's supposed to, to look like, because that's what Darwin in evolution says. We don't have it today. He probably did find something. We have no idea. 
But you will see Peking Mang. You will see this picture, this artist rendition in these museums. Next slide. Java Man. Java Man, 1891. Remember, 1859 is when Darwin orders his species coming. We're trying to look for these missing links. And this, up in the upper left, this picture was found. And then this artist made this rendition of B, C, and D of what this monkeyish monkey man looked like. And as it turns out, uh, somebody found later that this, all this was was a uh, galata baboon, or a gibbon, excuse me, a gibbon. And that's the actual picture of the gibbon. Next slide. So Java man's out, Peking man's out. All these are out. Again, you're going to see the museum. And this is Australopithecus, which you might know as Lucy. This was in the uh, Berkeley Museum for many years, and it was, it was more pieces found by, by this guy, uh, Oxnard, in the Olivai Gorge in, in Africa. And uh, this was a missing link for years. And there's, there's pictures. If you look up Lucy, there's pictures, and there's more bones and everything like this. Yeah, there's a good picture right there. And, and so they, they're trying to make it look, and if you look at Lucy on the left, like walk upright and all that sort of thing. But somebody like Stuart Burgess started looking at this, and he's an expert on the biomechanics of human running, uh, of feet, of ankles, of knees, of hips, and everything. And, uh, and when you start putting it together, like what it, what it really is, it ends up being um, basically a, a monkey. That's it. Bonobo monkey. And you can align the bonobo monkeys of today with Lucy. How many monkeys to men have we seen already? We've only seen what? Monkeys? We've only seen men. Okay, next slide. So in, in the biomechanics, in the particular biomechanics, so this is 1985, uh, probably before a lot of you were born here, maybe even before your parents were born. Uh, but, but you will see the differences, big differences between a human, a chimp, knee, and, and, the, and the biomechanics, and that's kind of what I do for research, some biomechanics things, uh, you'll see this very different joint on how, how the motion would happen uh, for, for locomotion for, for somebody, like human versus a monkey. Next slide. So that's really Lucy right there, the bonobo. Next slide. All right, Ramapithecus. So Ramapithecus is another one, uh, early monkey. And if you look at the picture on the upper left, from 1932 to 1977, this was sort of the, the idea uh, of, of what this slash monkey to man thing was. And uh, again, the man is on, on the upper, upper right. So, so there was this kind of thing, well, this is in between monkeys and man, and, and it has to be uh, one of the missing links, okay? Now, mind you, you get the idea of all those monkeys to man things, that people are finding like all these bodies everywhere, that they're finding all these things. No, they're just finding these little pieces, and they're making whole stories out of these, these little pieces. Okay, next slide. So who was Ram Rampithecus? Uh, once I believe the human ancestor, and there's, there's different pictures here. And it was based on this solitary jaw. Next slide. Another orangutan. These guys are just fooling us like crazy. If you watch a Planet of the Apes, the newest one, you, the newest Planet of the Apes, you'll see the orangutans are in all those movies, all the smarter ones. Yeah, it was found out in 1976 that that that, that Ramapithecus was 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 done. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. The next one's about uh, Nebraska man. Now, in 1925, at the Dayton trial, the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee, what was happened before 1925 is creationism was taught in schools. It was the Bible, and evolution said, "Well, look, evolution's happening. We have all these evidences." We have the Piltdown Man, we have the Java Man, and we have a Nebraska Man. We have all these evidence. So let's have evolution taught in public schools. And actually what happened in the law case, that, that, that was lost. They, they lost the argument. But the, but the social movement in the United States at the time moved it so much forward that, that evolution's taught, even today, that even creationism's not. So here we are, 100 years later, and a complete switch happened. 
which is crazy in my mind. So this was the picture. In fact, this was a picture in, um, in one of the newspapers at the time. And in the Scopes trial in Tennessee, when, when it was being argued, this Nebraska man was one of the main arguments about showing uh, monkeys to man. Next slide. Um, here's another picture of Nebraska man. It looked a little, uh, a little similar to um, uh, some of the other art artist renditions, if you will. Next slide. Now, this was based on a tooth, a single tooth. And they drew up this, this uh, Nebraska man based on this tooth. And they even had pictures. Go, go back. Go back to the picture, the first picture. Keep going back. This one here. By the way, so that's the Nebraska man walking. That's the wife down on the ground. Okay? You know, that's what a wife should be, right? On the ground, hump mumble bumbled at her husband, right? You know what I'm saying? She's like looking like, don't say that, Dr. Mark. No, I'm just teasing you, but Barbara's not here. I'm allowed to say anything I want. No, okay, so go ahead. So keep going. So n just note, there's a man and a woman, mo mother and, and dad. Okay, and there's a tooth. Next slide. So it wasn't found till later that another tooth was found. The same kind of tooth, and this time it was in a pig. So what was that tooth, the Nebraska man that was all that? It was the tooth of a pig. A pig. And that was the main argument. So that's the real Nebraska man right there. And legal arguments and courts of law were being made based on that. Next slide. So I heard somebody say, that you could take all the evidences related to monkeys and man, throw them on a pool table, and still play pool. And yet, if you are on, outside in some city, you go to some city, you go to Boston, you go to Philadelphia, and ask people on the street about what's the evidence for, for or do you believe in evolution? Yeah, why? We came from monkeys, yes. And you ask them, what's one evidence of that? What's one evidence? They won't be able to tell you a single one. Not a single one. Now get this. Their faith is in missing links. Their faith is in something missing. Their faith is in something that's invisible. Their, their faith is in something that they can't see. And they'll make a comment about me and my faith in God? Who's the illogical one here? We? No, maybe? So here's the thing. God created man about 6,000 years ago. If you just take the biblical ages and you add them up, it goes back about 6,000 years. You just add them up. It's just math. You go from the ages. Adam lived this long and he begat Seth, and Seth lived this long and he begat. Okay, you just keep going on. Next slide. And you could go to Genesis 5, do, do your own math there. So the issue is you have Adam and Eve... And you have God creating inside of Adam and Eve this capacity of variation. It's designed and engineered so that each of us is unique. Every human is unique. Every human is different. Acts 17 says he has made of one blood all nations men to dwell in forever and ever. Do you know we, we, we still have just all of us here have blood and we need the blood to live. And the blood has oxygen. And for each one of you, that oxygen needs to be there for you to live. But you do not look like the person next to you. You do not look like your parents. Your children will, will not look like you. Even identical twins, who are called clones in modern day language, even identical twins. They came from the same, same egg and sperm and then they broke off. Even them are different. They are different. They're unique. And they were engineered and designed for that uniqueness to the variations even to now. Even so, the difference in the melanin in our skin, so let's take those two right there. The difference in melanin of their skin is about 12%. That was designed into Adam and Eve from the very beginning. 
But what else is even more different than 12% melanin skin is the uniqueness of their souls. So the soul inside of you, that's unique. There was nobody ever, ever before you. There was nobody ever after you. You're unique. And it was now in, in this time in which you were created. You were created for here, now. Okay? And there's a plan and purpose. You didn't evolve from random chance events over a long period of time. It wasn't luck. It was by design. And it's better that you were born now, here, than 100 years ago or 100 years in the future. There's a plan and purpose in all these things because he engineered it. He planned it. Okay? Next slide. So we're all made in the image of God. doesn't matter who, who it is. And we all have these variation in ourselves. Go ahead. Next slide. Now, why is this important? I have people tell me, uh, who cares if evolution happened? Who cares if it was creation happened? In Psalm 11, verse 2, it says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? What the evolutionists really uh, thought about at the beginning was, we can get rid of the foundation. We can tear up the foundation. And that's Genesis 1 through 11. And so if we can just get rid of that, then all these other things will fail. See, this evolution says there's no God, uh, everything came here, and so all these other things from man's opinions, racism, homosexuality, pornography, abortion, all these things come up from a basic root belief that there's no God. These are just effects. That's not the cause. The cause is this evolutionary paradigm. Okay? Next slide. Now, there's a Bible verse that says that they will be willfully ignorant. Willfully ignorant. In their will, they will choose not to believe in God. Romans 1.20 says that we can understand God's character, nature, and attributes by the things he made. So nature itself is screaming out that there's aspects of God and who he is. He's screaming out to us these things. He's trying to, to and, and a lot of times we, we don't hear it. We don't see it. But he's trying to communicate that. Next slide. So in particular, the scripture says, scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their lust, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. And that's what evolutionists, there's, there's a key statement that evolutionists will say about in geology in the geologic column. They say the present is key to the past. So whatever is happening now in the same rate as now always happened before in the past. So it's always happened like this. So none of these catastrophic events will ever happen. I mean, who ca the, the Genesis flood really didn't happen. That wasn't a catastrophic event that changed the world. Jesus Christ never came, you know, and had the death, burial, and resurrection. And in the future, none of these things are going to happen. Jesus is not going to come back. There's not going to be these, these problems with the earth, like the book of Revelation says. None of that's going to happen. That's what they're saying. Everything continues. Next slide. So, I'm going to leave this, these last two slides. I put this at the beginning. Creationist faith is a belief in an all-knowing, perfect, never-changing being who observes all past history events. So, our trust is in this being who saw it all and wrote it down for us, right? Versus these humans who have, who have a belief in a limited knowledge, imperfect, always-changing being, who is not president. Who's not present at all? Remember, if they're saying dinosaurs lived 350 million years ago and only humans lived 100 million years ago, they didn't see them. Humans didn't see them. So set up the experiment then to prove that what you're saying is true. You can't. So it's just a belief. Next slide. So you have these truth claims. The one on the right is the materialism one. The one on the left is the theism one. And like I said, when I first, uh, uh, when I was a teenager, <clears throat> I believed the one on the right, that there was no God. And you compare that to the theistic one, you say God exists. This engineer exists to engineer everything. The one on the right says matter self-existed. So you either believe matter existed always or God existed always. There's no other option. Now, you can make up your own story, but it's just your story. And if you're making up your own story, you're saying you're God at that point because you know it all. And you know what? You don't know it all. Matter is all there is. 
versus, in addition to matter, there is a non-material entity, particularly like language. Language is a non-material entity. It's, it, the, the material itself doesn't dictate the information flow. Like, for example, I can say I love you. So the communication of an idea, I love you, went through sound waves to his ear, and it had a meaning. I can do this. And I just said the same thing. Now his eyes received something. The material did nothing. I could, t I could text him. I could write an email to him. The meaning and the message of the information had nothing to do with the material. The material didn't create anything. has no capacity to create. The material didn't create the message. It can't. Rocks can't do that. They think we came from rocks. Then second to last one, the cosmos is a closed system. Every event in the cosmos obeys changeless natural laws. Life's emergence is nothing more than outworking of these laws. So life came from non-life, called spontaneous generation. However, on the other side, the cosmos is an open system, open to reordering both by God and humans. Life and its genetic blueprints are the product of an intelligent, creative agent, an engineer. I call him creationary. Lastly, human beings are nothing more than a soulless animal. There's no rational basis for hope, meaning ascetics, or morality on the right. As opposed to the lower left, God has created human beings with godlike powers of language, volition, creativity, reason, self-awareness, moral discernment. If you look back to the Greeks like Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, they said, there is a God because I exist. I, 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 I exist here. I have a soul, and I'm aware, I'm self-aware of who I am. So there had to be an engineer that made me, that created me. This is the old ancient Greeks. So you're going to go through life, and you say, Dr. Mark, look, I see you're trying to say there's not much evidence for monkeys, not much evidence, monkeys to man things, or either monkeys or man's, and that's the main story. But what if these people, there, they act really smart and they demean me and they say, we know evolution's true. What, what they say that, we know. What about the newspapers that say it? And I'm going to be in a room and 99% and, and, and of everybody believes in evolution and I'm the only one that says, no, I believe the Bible. I've been in that room. I've been that person. I just go back. I say, let's start with the scientific method. Make the, what's the observation? You're working hypothesis. Evolution is true. Set up the experiment. Just set it up. Prove it to me. You show me your experiment that evolution happened, and you know what? I'll probably come and believe you. Go ahead. Send something up. It's 100 million years. You can't. You can't. You see what I'm saying here? All right. So you're going to run into that person. There is a person I grew up with. We were one day apart. I was born November 9th. He was born November 10th. We were in every class, every grade, from kindergarten to high school. And when my brother got married, one of my brothers got married, I said, Michael, I said, um, you know, I have become a Christian. I'm following Christ. I'm doing this kind of thing. There's a God in heaven. I said, please come to God. And he said, No. I said, why not? He goes, because evolution. I said, you don't believe in God because evolution. Yep, yep. I said, what's your one evidence for evolution never to happen? And he said, the fossil record. The fossil record. And I said, you know, in Darwin's book in 1859, The Origin of Species, Darwin's claim is the problem with evolution is the fossil record. You see, if the earth were billions of years old, and if we came from monkeys to man, we would expect hundreds and thousands of all these entities, animals that would be like, you know, 10% monkey, 90% man, 20% monkey, 80% man, 50% monkey, 50% man, 90% monkey. We would expect hundreds and thousands of these because the, the earth is so old. There'd be all these. Michael, guess how many we found? None. Zero. The only thing we know about missing links are they're missing. And with that, 
I'm done. Let me pray for you. Father, uh, I, I just pray for every soul here, God, that they would see you, that you made them, you engineered them, you created them for purpose, for a plan. And that all the information coming today, Lord, that somehow you'd settle it in their heart, in their mind, their soul, so that they would know these things. I pray that, that as they get confronted in the future, that you would let them remember these things we're saying so that they wouldn't be deceived. So I just commit all these students, all these young people up to you and the, and the old people. I lift them all up before you. And I pray as they walk out those doors, Lord, that they would be a changed person, that they would see you and that you have a plan and purpose and that the truth will make them free. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, question answer time.